Hi everyone, welcome to my talk on testing a data science model. Uh, this is an emerging area and I appreciate it's quite new, therefore that motivated me to give you this talk and share all the knowledge that I've gained throughout my journey of testing a data science model. So without further ado, let's get started. About me. So I've graduated with a BSc Honours in Computer Science. I fell into testing and I've got eight plus years of experience now. And these are some of the areas uh, that I've worked in in various industries. Some of my hobbies include dancing, yoga, teaching and baking. The table of contents today is ar around what is a data science model. So I'll explain to you everything from the very basics and the process around testing it and some useful uh, tips for you to take away and some useful information that I learned from, um, from my journey. Currently, 80% of UK business are looking to hire data scientists or seek data consultancy. IBM anticipates that data science will account for 28% of all digital jobs by 2020. So this statistics that we can see in front of us is quite good and it's, it's quite motivating. That's why I really found it so useful that I wanted to share it with all of you and get you on board with testing data science models. So what is data science models? So data science, especially just data science, is a set of tools and algorithms which unveil hidden patterns from raw data. It allows decisions and predictions to be made and the aim of making informed decision. So think of a data science, think of data science in a more forward looking approach. It's more of a real world scenario. It's an exploratory way with the focus on analyzing the past and or the current data. With predictive analytics, that's your first buzzword of the session, which I'll explain later, um, organizations can find and look into patterns contained within data in order to detect risks and opportunities. Now, what is a model? So let me give you a simple analogy here. So imagine you're going into work and you get into your car, you uh, put your seatbelt on, a bit of aircon and music, and there we go, we start our, our driving. So that's your driving experience, that's the data. Then um, you get into the main road and you are stuck in traffic and now you're thinking around ways of how do I get out of this traffic? Should I just turn left or right where possible, take a U-turn and maybe take a different route? Uh, that's more of the computing side of things where your brain is trying different patterns to learn what works best. And then the model side of, thing, uh, the model side of things are where there is an equation of data inputs affecting your target value. In this case, your target value is how long it took you to get to work. So if you got to work on time, that means your model was working fine and it doesn't need a lot of optimizing. But if you got stuck in that traffic and you couldn't reach at work on time, that means your model needs a bit of optimizing. So I, I hope this uh, little analogy helped you understand around models. Let me give you another example, actually. So imagine for a manufacturing firm, uh, you can check what they sold last week and check what, if the same assumptions were used, uh, what is an acceptable uh, sale for next week. So this is uh, around sales data of a client to improve their production. So uh, a model assesses a set of conditions and guides you to make more informed decisions. Remember, a model is a statistical black box. Models use probability distribution to understand the behavior of its inputs. It's more of a what if kind of situation. So if a customer uses uh, the parameters the model suggested, then what their business could look like. It uses genetic algorithms. That's your second buzzword of the day. This uh, genetic algorithms um, basically uh, is an algorithm that reflects the process of natural selection where the fittest individuals are selected and it's inspired by Charles Darwin. Models produce some indications that are being used as guidelines by our clients. And what do we do as testers? We, as testers, test against that expected outcome. So benefits of data science models. It helps craft better decision-making, identify opportunities, 
actions based on trends to help define goals, data-driven evidence, and identification and refining of target values, and mimic, mimics real-life scenarios. As you can see, it's quite data-rich. So let's learn a little bit around the data side of things. So a model needs data, and data can be divided into these areas, so structured, semi-structured, unstructured, or metadata. So structured data adheres to predefined models. Easy, it's easy to aggregate uh, data from various locations and databases. It's easy to store, access, and process, such as Excel files. Semi-structured data is more, uh, is more around self-describing data, which uses tags or markers, uh, such as JSON or XML files. Unstructured data is one where uh, the data is not organized in a predefined manner. It has irregularities in the data, therefore quite ambiguous, such as videos or audio. And metadata, lastly, is one which provides additional information about a data set. So, for example, a photograph, where was it taken and when was it taken? Now, in my case, I've used a mix of structured and semi-structured data for my model. So let me explain this to you. Uh, when we were initially getting data from our clients, we would get it in a kind of a structured way, but that was not accepted by our model. It had some irregularities in that data. So what the data engineers uh, did after that is create a JSON uh, helper file to allow the clients to send us that data in a much more structured way so that our model could understand it. So we mixed a bit of structured and semi-structured ways for our model to uh, be able to give us the right results. And um, one more important thing here to uh, mention is data biases, right? So if your data scientists or data engineers are actually wrangling any data, make sure as testers, we know what they're wrangling because this might impact our testing. So um, if, if you know, you should better, uh, you should ask them, or if they're doing it, they should communicate this with you. Um, just in case um, your end results uh, look different and you're unaware about it. So a simple architecture here. So I would like to explain to you um, how this works with this architecture. And I'll give you an example at the end of the, the architecture as well. So here you can see you've got your database, you've got your logs and your raw data is coming in. So your data is extracted. Then you have your feature extraction and pre-processing. So your free features are being applied to the raw data. You have your learning algorithm, which is where your predictive analytics comes in place. So let me explain what that is. So predictive analytics is the use of data, statistical algorithms, and machine learning techniques to identify the likelihood of future outcomes based on historical data. Organizations use this uh, to sift through current and historical data to detect trends and forecast events and conditions that should occur at a specific time based on supplied parameters. After this, the learning uh, part happens and then you apply, the, apply it to the model. So in terms of the model, we have our genetic algorithms, we have our business logic that's being applied. So it can sometimes cause uh, some randomness in the model or stochasticness, which it which was in my kind of situation, in my situation and the model we were using. I'll explain randomness and stochastic stochasticness in the next few slides to you as well. So then the model is applied, and then you have your future like looking data. So let me put an example over this then. So say if you're providing money on credit, then the probability of customers making future credit payments on time is a matter of concern to you. Here, you can build a model which can perform predictive analytics on the payment history of the customer to predict if future payments will be made on time or not. Be careful, be careful of the elephants in the room. This is really, really important. We all as a team need to be on the same boat. If we all have ambig uh, ambiguities or assumptions, we will change everyone's mindset in the team. So we all have to be on the same page. So as testers, what I would suggest is be part of every possible meeting you can, which is useful for your testing. So um, I would say um, be there when the requirements gathering is happening and understand the problem and the data that you're using. So what 
what's the story behind the data? How are we trying to uh, find a solution for our clients from these requirements that we are gathering? In the planning session, uh, brainstorm possible solutions with the team. Um, in the design session, you can also prototype potential solutions and evaluate its effectiveness. You don't have to design these as, as a tester, but you can help a UX designer with your feedback, for example. At the end of the day, as testers, we are closest to the clients. So if we don't understand the product, then it's highly likely that the client won't either. So let's try and be very open and transparent around everything that we understand of the product or what we don't understand. Also, um, then when you're testing, all of this will aid your testing. So it's really good to have all of this rich information to help you create better test scenarios. Also, something that I find quite useful is the Three Amigos session. I quite like it because I can get a lot of information throughout it. So from the business point of view, what problem are we trying to solve? And then from the development side of things, how might we build a solution to solve this problem? And then from the testing side of things, um, what could possibly happen with this implementation or how would your implementation impact the product? These are the kind of questions that arise in that session and help everyone understand, not just the tester. So let's get started. So a model can be of two types, as you can see, it could be off the shelf or custom made. Whatever uh, model you go for, make sure you have some sort of test strategy around it. And you also have some strategy to how often you're going to train your model. Um, by that, I mean how often you're going to input data, run it, and output some results. Also, um, it's vital that um, with the use of custom-made uh, models, you might have some stochasticness. So what I mean by stochasticness is I'll explain to you via an analogy again. So five plus three for me and you all is eight, but for the model, it could be something else. So five would go in as it is, three would go in as it is, and it would be an exact match at the end of a result. But the result eight would actually be 8.0000065. Now, when I look at that, I would instantly think something's not right. What's happened here? Why couldn't the model just give me eight? Now, this is where something that I brought into the team with the help of the data scientists and engineers is thresholds. Having thresholds in place for models was really, really vital because you wouldn't understand your results otherwise. And sometimes they could be too off. Sometimes they could be within your limit, but you wouldn't understand. So with the help of the thresholds, that actually saved me so much time analyzing my results. So we have a threshold of three to 5%. And anything within that threshold is acceptable. Anything outside that threshold is not acceptable. So that's where I would go and talk to the data scientists. So this would be something that would be useful for you as well. If you're working with custom-made models, how can you understand that your results are accurate? So I think thresholds would be beneficial. If you're using, if you're working in a more critical environment, such as credit card fraud, maybe your thresholds can be minimal um, than what we have. The testing process. So it's important to verify the data set uh, that you're using for the model. Try to understand the story behind um, what you're trying to test and how that data is helping you. Also, um, it's uh, vital uh, to validate the input versus the output of your data results. Check the shape of your data. Testing the outputs will explain if the values are of the right type and the data columns are matching or not. Test the areas you are certain and test the areas you are uncertain about with thresholds in place, as, just, as I just explained. Um, Make sure the data pipeline works as expected. So make sure there's no, no data being dropped off or any duplicates formed. Um, test using different parameters. So what I mean by this is for my model to run, I need to add some parameters. We've got a minimum that we allow and we've got a maximum and there's space for the middle bit. So I tested the mins and the max and the middle bit as well. And what I found was um, the model did work but the model took a lot of time when I was mixing and matching these default and minimums and maximums. 
So in a way, I was trying, I was, I was doing a passive way of performance testing of the model, but it was quite useful because it helped me understand if I use the maximum values, the model was running for a bit longer. If I if I was using the default values, then the model was running for the, for an acceptable time. So it's useful to do some kind of edge case style testing this way as well. You you learn from it. You learn from what you're testing, and then explore the model. I think it's quite useful to go out with a blank uh, mindset and not going specifically to test a feature because when you're exploring the model, you don't have a wide agenda in your mindset. You're just going and you're going to ex uh, uh, explore the, uh, the product and see what kind of anomalies you find. So there might be a hidden bug there that you um, that you didn't know because you were doing feature testing, but when you explored, you found another bug. So that's super important. At one point, I actually did um, find a bug and I saved the team from taking that into production. So that was really, really useful. And I would definitely suggest for all of you to even um, look into that. Also, I just realized, um, as the model can provide random results each time, um, you run, brace the uncertainty, try and understand if it's still okay or if it's 100% anomaly. Some more testing. So when a new feature comes in, um, there is nothing you can compare your run to. Since it's a new implementation, you're more bound to finding issues or around it. So try applying different, uh, try applying different configuration parameters for edge case style testing to see the model outputs as well. Also, I would suggest work on a test plan with a data scientist, try and understand what they have uh, done in the model to help you create better test scenarios. Consult your results with, with a data scientist for more conciseness. Make sure the logic is tested uh, by them on unit tests. Uh, run the model prior to the new feature and after to understand how it improved your results or what has actually changed to help you understand better. And as always, um, exploratory testing. Try and test your feature, but also once you're finished, try and explore further, see, see what else you can find. So this is the new feature that you would test. Then I try and do regression testing. So regression testing is to confirm that a recent program or code change has not adversely affected existing feature and make sure any bugs that were found previously are resolved. So in this kind of testing, uh, what I do is I compare historic runs or what we call it delta or baseline runs of a model that I might, might have run in a previous release to the latest uh, release and compare and check what trends I see. Remember, some models can have a degree of randomness, but if you have a threshold, then you have a solution there. Uh, no equation for the best answers exist. Rely on a good enough and fast enough result. Provide accurate predictions and insights that can be used to enable critical uh, and strategic business decisions. And I know all of you may be thinking about automation, so even with the advancement of technology, 100% automation in this area may not, uh, is not achievable uh, because it requires extensive maintenance. And also uh, the machine would not understand the calculations I specifically want to perform on my results unless you can um, automate your thresholds in there as well. So that's something to look into. Some useful questions to think about. So what is an acceptable test? How, how do I know what I'm testing is acceptable? So this is somewhere where, where you can discuss with a data engineer or even the team or even the data scientist. Has a run completed and nothing broke within various stages of a model? Is there any flakiness? Is there some, is there some sort of intermittent bug that happens once mm -hmm. and then it doesn't happen for some time, but that it, then it haunts us again? So look into all of that. Have we found anomalies? Are there really anomalies or is it a matter of just checking it's within your threshold? Did we drop some data? And if we did, where did we drop it? Is it the first time or has this been happening but we didn't know? How do we know that we've produced the right result? So this is something that would always kind of, I would always have this question in my head, but then you can use the, the uh, res, uh, target, you can set some target um, thresholds, as I've uh, explained earlier, from three to 5%. And also you could, um, you could also rely on the confidence levels you have from 
previous uh, kind of release runs or regressions, like as I explained, your delta or baseline runs. So that would help you understand that your results are not quite, they're not really deviated, they're within the threshold. And how accurate are my results? So again, confidence levels from previous runs. Um, what is an acceptable deviation? Well, uh, depending on the thresholds you set, then if your results are outside that threshold, then it's quite deviated. And if it's within the threshold, then you're, it's actually not an anomaly or a deviation. So this is something to think about uh, within your team. And it, and, and it can come from testers, actually. It's, it's quite useful if you ask as many questions as possible, or the five whys. So let's practice a little bit. Here I've added uh, some locations and the number of birds on these locations. So as you can see, A1 has 28 birds. So what happens here is uh, you would put this data through to your model. Your model will start running and then it will provide some results on a dashboard or depending on what choice uh, you are viewing your results. So useful kind of questions to think around here is, from a tester's point of view is how many birds were counted on the last site or how many uh, what is the average number of birds seen on a site what is the total number of birds counted on sites which with code start beginning with c um what what would i expect next week um in terms of the number of birds in location a for example so this is more future like question um will i expect no birds in location A next week, for example. So this is more like now predicting, checking what the future could look like. So the, the, this would be useful questions that you can ask in your team as well. And then once you have completed your testing, then you can think around, have we got a good understanding of what the model has provided to us? Are the predictive analytics working as, as expected and the business logics as well? Uh, does the shape of my data look as expected. So by shape, I do not mean a circle or a triangle. I mean a histogram or a graph. Are we seeing massive dips or any anomalies on the graph? In, in my case, I tend to use the mean, the standard deviation, the absolute difference, and the percentage difference to help me validate my results. Some complexities that I've come across. So how can we mimic the client data? So anonymizing, uh, data first may look uh, well, because you might just have a few clients, maybe one or two, uh, but complexities will come when more complex data comes in and new features are built around it. Therefore, a good solution would be to somehow mimic a golden data set or what we call synthetic data. Now, when we are creating a synthetic data set, we need to bear in mind that we pick all the important features we want this data to uh, work with. So any high risk areas, any vital kind of features, group them together so you can create that data set for that and test that it would work. You can always work uh, uh, on this with a developer and pair it together. If we anonymize, we need we need to make sure the file sizes match the client file. So if we are anonymizing any uh, raw data from the clients, try and match the, ex the exact characters in each column. Don't try and resize them or don't try and shortcut to uh, maybe shorter names or shorter words, because this might impact um, when you're uploading your files on, up to the model, like it happened with me actually. So um, I, I changed the client descriptions, which were very big into description one, two, three, and so on and so forth. So my model was working perfectly fine because my files were getting uploaded and they were completely fine. But there was a pilot, there was a customer that we were going to pilot with and um, their files were quite chunky and quite rich with data. So our model did not accept that because it was a very big file. So this is something where I found a gap. I thought to myself, right, if I wouldn't have changed these characters, would this file still be able to? Uh, upload successfully. So these are the things we can think around as well. Also policies, respect your client policies, any data that you're using from your client, make sure it's deleted once you've used it. Um, it's, it's quite important to respect those areas and understand the model complexities. Um, 
It takes time to understand a statistical uh, model. Therefore, take time to pair with developers, data scientists, data engineers even, to understand everything such as how it functions, uh, the data schema, what is accepted as data, what is not, and e explore, explore uh, the model. It is a massive playground. You can explore as long as it's not as, as long as you're not playing in the production environment, obviously. Um, next one is uh, silos. So try and avoid any knowledge silos. Whatever you learn or whatever you understand um, separately from a group meeting, try and document it. Try and keep it so that everyone has access to it. And dependencies. One thing I always talk about depends dependencies is catch your dependencies before the dependencies catch you. So if there are any features that are in the back end side of things and we have an idea that it will also impact the front end, try and plan that within your ticket. Don't just plan for your back end because as testers, we would just uh, we would be willing to do a smooth test uh, end to end. But if the if only the back end side of things are changed, and front end is untouched, then we are blocked. And then again, we'll have to create a new ticket in the next uh, sprint to add what we missed. So it's important to make sure our um, dependencies are captured always from the very start. Some tips for you to take away. So make sure you understand the data from a business point of view. Don't derail. I know there's a lot of assumptions, but try and stick on the track. Make sure we stick to consumer requirements. Review and analyze any specifications, define your test scenarios, um, execute test scripts, review, report, document, anything that you find that's vital. Your model mimics real life scenarios with tons of assumptions. Assumptions limit scope, as you cannot pick all assumptions realistically, as underlining maths and algorithm will end up becoming too complex and interfere with what needs to be delivered. Be ready for discrepancies, and sometimes it's okay to embrace them if you've got thresholds in place. By providing statistics and facts for employees that they can access at any time, you are creating a smart and savvy team that can use these insights to drive more business. Once you have these processes within the team, stick to, to them and look for ways of optimizing it. At the end of the day, we are not just optimizing the model here, we are also optimizing our teams. Be present in all vital meetings, and it's okay not to know everything. There are too many algorithms as it is. Pairing is useful. Raise any of your concerns and ask as many questions as you like. Make sure new features are being released often and bugs are not repeatable. So what does this leave me with? A tester who came with all their testing uh, knowledge and learned data science validation. So what do we become? A hybrid tester. Some useful tools that I used, and that could be useful to you as well, is SQL. When we had databases, we were using uh, SQL. Now we don't use any database. Um, statistics, uh, some statistics is useful. You don't have to be a, a math pro. Um, Excel files, which I was using for my data validations. Uh, developer tools to test my front end. And Miro board to open any kind of discussions, any kind of um, um, kind of planning sessions that, uh, or grooming sessions even through the mirror board that I found that quite useful. So just a little wrap up. Um, remember, edge case testing is vital. Explore the model as much as you can. Make sure the model is quite accurate and the, uh, with precisions and its metrics. Make sure the model can perform at scale with, new, uh, with all the new features and it's also maintainable. So thank you very much for hearing my talk. I hope this was useful to you and I hope I have motivated you to, uh, to join in this area. Uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, on Twitter, and I would be more than happy to share more information with you or even learn from you. Thank you.